Glory, glory, glory to God. My name is Pastor Linda Cowles, and we are here today from Anointed Community Services International, and I want to continue our study of exploring God's Word, learning about the Bible. You know, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he was walking with the disciples on the road to Elimaeus, and they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. But he began to talk to them and he began to say they were slow of learning and that they did not recognize him. And then he opened their eyes and they recognized who he was. And he began to expound on the scriptures concerning himself all the way back from the days of Moses. So the scripture lets us know that Jesus was introduced to the world all the way back in the Old Testament. And that's why we're having these lessons today, to take you back through the Old Testament and to show you Christ. Amen. Before we get started, we're going to have a word of prayer and pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that God will give you wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Father God, we just thank you today for all of those that are visiting this, this video and listening by this medium. Lord God, I pray this day that you will open the eyes of everyone's understanding. Grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation as they come into the knowledge of you. Lord God, I pray that your word will take root in the heart of each and every listener. And Lord God, that it will bring forth fruit as we know it always does. Lord God, we thank you that one plant one water, but you give the increase. Give that increase, Lord God, of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to be sharing my screen with you so that you can see some visuals. It has been studied that one, an individual learns 52% more when they hear and see. That's why visuals are so important. Even the television and the media knows it. That's why they show you pictures on the TV screen because we intake, we grasp, we understand better when we can not only hear, but when we can hear and see. So I pray that these presentations will be of value to you and they will help you be able to see what God's word is telling us today. So we are on uh, the time of the patriarchs. Uh, the patriarchs being those who were prophets and forerunners before the days of Jesus. In the Old Testament, we had patriarchs, Moses, Noah, Abraham. Those were all what we call today patriarchs. So bear with me as I share my screen with you, and we will follow along and see what the Lord has to say today. Okay. All right. All right, so the chosen nation. Here we're talking about the nation that God called out. And he called out a nation through one man, that man name was Abram. Abram, not Abraham. God changed his name later on. And so we're going to talk about all of that. Why did God have a chosen nation? Because from the beginning of time, God was looking for a man. How many know that in the beginning, God created Adam, hoping that he would be that man to carry on and be the, the vessel to, to be a steward and to have dominion over this land. But Adam disobeyed and pretty much sold the human race out to the enemy, to the devil. And therefore, uh, man is ruled and directed most of the time by his own sinful nature. 
but God is looking for a people that will unite with him, that would be reconciled back to him, that will love him and obey and keep his commandments. So the chosen nation, first and foremost, he's looking for a people that will have faith in him. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro, seeking those whose heart is perfect toward him, those who believe him, those who choose to worship him as the God that he is, the creator of the universe, because it's God who made all things. So we're going to talk here about the chosen nation. And as you can see here on the screen, there's uh, many pictures. We see how uh, uh, Lot and his family fled from the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that in just a minute. Okay, just going to get our, our pieces here together uh, on the screen. And uh, then we'll take it from there. Okay. All right. All right. So as in the days of Noah, God looked upon the earth and found a man, a man with whom he could make a covenant. Just like in the days of Noah, our previous lesson talked about the days of Noah and how God found Noah, a man who found grace in God's sight. Just a second, we'll move our, move our um, screen back. This man had come from Ur of the Chaldeans with his father, Terah. And I want you, if you have your Bibles, to go with me uh, to the book of Genesis. And we will um, pull up this story. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, and I'm going to start at verse 31. Most of the time when we talk about Abram being called of God, we go to chapter 12. But there's a mystery in the Bible. Matter of fact, there are many mysteries in the Bible. There are many treasures in the Bible. There's hidden mysteries and treasures, and it takes studying, and it takes meditating, and it takes uh, breaking down the scriptures to be able to find those jewels. The Bible says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but kings search it out. And you and I, if we're born again today, we're kings and queens. And so we study to show ourselves approved unto God. All right. So Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31 says, and Terah, now Terah was the father of Abram. And he had other sons. He had Haran. Uh, it tells us who all his sons were. He had Nahor. Uh, if you read the entire 11th chapter, you'll see who the sons of Terah were. But Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now in this portion of scripture, we see that Terah was taking Abram and Sarah and Lot, his son, Haran's son. And the reason he had Lot is because Haran had died. Haran was the son of Terah who uh, died before his own father died. And so it left Terah to take care of Lot, his grandson. So they were going from Ur of the Chaldees they were going into the land of Canaan. Now, as we know, those of us who know the Bible, the Bible says that God called Abram to go, and he was to go to the land of Canaan. But it looks to me like God was looking for a man. He didn't care who it was. I believe that maybe God told Terah to go to Canaan 
or he told Abram to go and Abram being with his father told his father. Maybe the latter is true. So there's many mysteries in the Bible. Sometimes we don't have answers to all of them unless the Holy Spirit gives them to us. So we're going to go with the latter, that God had called Abram and told him to go to the land of Canaan. And Abram told his father, Terah, and Terah took the family on their way to Canaan. But they came to the city called Haran. It's amazing that this city had the same name as Terah's son, Haran, Lot's father. And I heard one message that Terah got to this land and grieved for his son. And grief kept him from going forward. And he literally died in the land of Haran. So we see that they weren't able to go to Canaan at that time. So let's move down to the verse, the next chapter, chapter 12. Chapter 12 says this, now the Lord had said unto Abram. So it says the Lord had said, meaning he had already spoken this. So it's just a repeat of what the Lord had said. Get thee out of that country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now, Abram was leaving, but he didn't leave his kindred. He had, first of all, his father was going with him, but his father died. And then he had Lot, his nephew. And of course, he had Sarai, his wife. And God promised Abram saying, and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed. The first sign of Abram's love for God was turned into not only faith, but faith and obedience. If someone told you to go across the street, I'll meet you there and give you $10. If you believe that individual, you'll go across the street and wait for them. So obviously, Abraham believed God, and the Bible says he departed. He left his land of Aaron. He departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So here the Lord even tells us how old Abram was. And I believe that God lets us know how old he was so that we can see just how long he waited before Isaac, his son, was born. This was a promise. Genesis 12 Chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, God made a promise. He said, I will. When you tell someone you will do something, that's a promise. And people look for you to keep your word. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. The Bible lets us know that the Old Testament was written for our example. It gives us an example of the ways of God. If God was faithful to Abram, he will be faithful to you. So this is the call of the chosen nation, the nation that we call today Israel. So Abram left, as we see, and if you read this whole chapter, you will see how it says, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. So even in Haran, there were people who followed them. Maybe there were uh, slaves or uh, servants that came from Haran and followed them. The Bible says, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sishem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built 
he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, in those days, the Israelites, although Abram was not an Israelite yet, Abram was a pagan and he worshiped pagan gods. But the God of the universe spoke to him. We don't know if he spoke to him in a dream or if he spoke to him audibly. But however he spoke to him, he told Abram to leave and Abram leaved, left. And as we read through the scriptures, we see how they journeyed toward the south and how they came to a place of uh, where the servants of Abram and the servants of Lot strove together. So Lot uh, was of age and Lot had servants and Lot had cattle. Abram had cattle and the cattle began to multiply and the cattle became so large that they had to share space. Uh, Abram's cattle was in the same area as Lot's cattle. And Lot had servants taking care of his cattle. And one day they began to get into a strife and an argument over location and over whose cattle is who. And Abram said, we be brethren. Don't let us uh, have strife. If you go to the 13th chapter of Genesis, you will see that they came to a place that they strove. And it says 13 and five says, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. So here we see their, their cattle began to multiply. They began to increase and the land could not contain them because they had outgrown the place where they were. And it says that, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. That's verse seven of chapter 13. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled there in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So he was saying, listen, we're related. Don't let us get into an argument. Would to God that many say that today, that families would not get into arguments, that they would work together. So then he said, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham or Abram at the time was not even selfish. He didn't try to choose the best land. He gave, he gave Lot the option of choosing. And he said, whichever way you go, I'll go the opposite. If you choose to go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you choose to go to the left, I'll go to the right. Abram was a compromiser. He compromised with Lot in order to keep peace. God will that we compromise today in order to keep peace with one another. And the scripture says in the 10th verse, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest into Zor. So when Lot looked up and he saw this beautiful land that was just as beautiful as the garden of Eden was, it was luscious, it had fruit, it had green grass, it just looked so pretty. But look at Lot, he's selfish, he's choosing the better part, giving Abram whatever was less left, whether it was parched land or desert, he didn't care. He wanted to be in the uh, best part of the land. So it says, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom.
Now, you know, if Lot had been led of God, if Lot had been praying, then Lot would have known that Sodom was a wicked place. But Lot obviously was making his decision according to his flesh, according to his own desires, according to what he thought was good. He was looking on the outward and seeing the luscious land, and he chose that land and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, if you were to study your Bible, which I hope that you do, I hope that you'll take time to read from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through uh, chapter uh, uh, 17, and you will see what happened in this area. I'm just going to uh, cover just a little bit of it. But as, as Lot set his tent towards Sodom, first he set his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, he moved into Sodom. He started getting closer and closer to the world. You know, this is the way it happens with believers sometimes. And Lot obviously was a believer. We can show you in the New Testament where it says Lot was righteous. So Lot uh, was looking after his flesh, following after the things of the flesh, following after the things of the world, the way the world looked. And he pitched towards Sodom. Then next thing you know, he ended up in Sodom. But he was still holding on to his beliefs, holding on to his moral uh, compass, so to speak. And Lot went into Sodom. And Sodom was a wicked city. Sodom was filled with uh, whoremongers, fornicators, robbers, thieves, and even those who went with the same sex. It was a wicked city in the sight of God. And one day, Abram was out in the field, maybe meditating or tending to his flock. And he saw three men coming toward him. And Abram, being a godly man, a praying man, discerned that these were holy men. And when he discerned that, as they came closer, he told them, let me fetch you something to eat. One thing that God teaches us, even in the New Testament, is hospitality. When visitors come, when people from other nations come, and especially the brethren, we feed them, we're hospitable, we open our homes. In the days of Jesus, they washed Jesus' feet. They washed one another's feet because of the long journeys that they took through the desert area. So Abram saw these men and he said, come, let me fetch you something to eat. And he ran to his tent and he told Sarai to have the servants go out and get a lamb and to slay it and let's cook it and let's fix these men food. And that's exactly what they did. And while Abram went back out, while Sarah was cooking the meal, Abram went back out to talk with them, I'm sure to give them a drink of cold water, a drink of cold juice, whatever he had. And he sat and talked to them. And one of those men was the Lord in the form of man. And he began to speak to Abram and to remind Abram that he would visit Sarah and he would give him a son. And as we see in the scriptures that the Lord told Abram that he would visit her and that he would give them a son. Let's find that scripture here where the Lord uh, uh, promised or spoke to Abram uh, and said that. Okay. It's chapter 18, chapter 18 of Genesis. And it says, and the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mary, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. 
And it goes on to tell us how Abram ran and told Sarah to fix the food and do all of that. Now, the Bible says, now Abram was old and stricken, well stricken in age. So let's go up to the uh, ninth verse or go down to the ninth verse after Abram ran and got the food and everything. And they said unto him, they who, the men that came, the three men, where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abram and Sarah was old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. What does that mean? She was no longer having her, her menstrual. And so how could she have a child in essence? But God can do anything. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. She laughed about it because they had to do something to get pregnant, right? <laughs> and the Lord said unto Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Now here we see that Abram's name has been changed. We can read that in the uh, chapter 17, where the Lord came and called Abram, no, long Abram, no longer Abram, but God said his name would be Abraham. That word Abraham or that name Abraham means father of many nations. So the name in itself was prophetic. So when everyone called Abram, Abraham, they were prophesying that he was the father of many nations. You know, God is so strategic and it makes a difference what we say. So Abram uh, became the father of many nations just by prophetic utterance. So we see where uh, Sarah laughs within herself and the Lord said unto Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying she didn't laugh. And the Lord told her, yes, you did. I heard you and saw you. So here we see that as they went through life, uh, at one point, Sarah uh, doubted whether she could be the one to have that child. And so she sent Abram into her handmaid, Hagar, who had come with them from Egypt. And Hagar gave birth to Ishmael in Genesis chapter 16, verse 15. Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations who are at enmity with the Israelis, even to this day. But later on, at the age of 100, Abram, from 75 years to 100, that means 25 years later, Abram gives birth to Isaac from Sarah, his wife. And Abram was given the covenant of circumcision that he would circumcise his sons, meaning that they would be in covenant relation with God. And what God had promised to Abram, that promise was also to his sons. That's what a covenant does. During this time though, uh, of Lot being in Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels that visited Abraham, when the angels visited Abraham, if you kept reading in the 18th chapter, you'll see that the angels were on their way. They were on a mission. They were on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because the wickedness was so great. But Abraham being the prayer warrior that he was, drew near, the Bible says, to the Lord. 
He drew near, as the scripture says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. What does that mean? Draw near means come near to God in prayer. Come near to God in communication and in petition. So Abram drew near. If you read down, uh, you'll see in verse 23, and Abraham drew near and said, I know you're going to, in essence, I'm paraphrasing here. I know you're going to destroy this city, but what if there's someone righteous in there? Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked God? Don't let this be. You're, you're supposed to be a righteous God. You do justly. And he said, will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? Was, was Lot righteous? Was his family righteous? They were righteous because they believed in the God of Abraham, the God who told them to go to Canaan. Were they perfect? By no means necessary, but they were part of Abram's family and they knew the Lord that called Abram. And so Abram said, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, God, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, Abram, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And then you'll see where Abram went down. He said, well, what if there's only 40? What if there's only 10? And God said, I will spare the city for their sake. And what did God end up doing? There were not 10 righteous. Unfortunately, there were only four that came out with Lot. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, his son-in-law, and maybe their children, they didn't want to come out of Sodom. They laughed at Lot when Lot told them about the angel's visit. So what happened in that story? It's good to read your Bible. I'm not going to take all the time to go through every single thing, but what happened was those angels showed up in Sodom, and Lot saw them in the street, and Lot perceived, just like Abraham perceived and had discernment, that they were holy men. There was something about them. And so Lot told them, come into my home, come into my home and have food and let me wash your feet. So Lot did the same thing that Abram did. Why? Lot was righteous. He was brought up in the same way as Abram was. And he brought those men into his house. And when he did, the men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is where we get the word sodomites. If you look it up, it means those who prefer the opposite sex. It was homosexuality in that day. And so the men of that city came to Lot's house and knocked on his door, almost breaking the door down demanding that Lot bring those men out to them so that they can know them. What does that mean? That word know means intimate. If you look up the original Hebrew word, it means that we may be intimate with them. They wanted to have sex with those men. Those men were holy men. And Lot went outside and said, be it far from you. He even offered his own daughters who were virgins to those men, but they didn't want a woman. They wanted those men angels. Ha, huh. sounds like the world today. They wanted those men angels. And they were about to break down Lot's door. And you go back and read your Bible, please. Read that chapter 18, 19. They were about to break down Lot's door for those men. And those men opened Lot's door, pulled Lot in, and smote those men with blindness because they were angels and they had the power to do so. They smote those men with blindness that they could not see the door anymore. And then 
The angels took Lot and his family. They had to literally grab them by the hand because they were, they were uh, lagging behind. They were taking their time about coming out. And the angels had to literally grab them by the hand and pull them out of the city so that the city, they would not be destroyed in the city. Why were they doing this? Because God heard Abraham's prayers. Abraham prayed, if there be 10 righteous in the city, would you not spare them? Lot was considered righteous. Let's find the scripture in the New Testament that confirms that Lot was That scripture in the New Testament is 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. And it says, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day. And I'm going to go up a bit and uh, let you know that that's talking about Lot. Second Peter, in case you didn't hear it, chapter two and verse eight. Let's go up verse seven. And let's go up, matter of fact, to verse five. And spared not, to my God, spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in, excuse me, bringing in flood upon the world. I'm trying to get back to this. There we are. Bringing in uh, the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. That doesn't mean just Lot, like just Lot by himself. That means that he was just, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, meaning that though he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, he was vexed. His soul was grieved with their lifestyle and with their conversation. For that righteous man dwelling among them in hearing in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So it says that Lot was a righteous man and that his soul was vexed by their ungodly deeds. But God delivered them out of Sodom. And it was Lot's wife who looked back because the God had given a commandment. When you go out, do not look back. Looking back shows that she wanted what was back there. She didn't want to leave. She was more concerned about what was back there than what was in front of her. That's why even in this life in God, we're not to look back. We're not to try to go back to our old ways, but we're to go forward in God. And so they flee from Sodom and Gomorrah, as you can see from the picture here at the bottom, Genesis 19, 1 through 28. And then here comes the birth of Isaac. In Genesis 21, chapter uh, 1, chapter 21, verse 1 through 3. And the Lord visited Sarah as, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abram a son in his old age, at the time set of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Praise God. And then we see as Isaac grew up and was a bit older, that God tested Abraham and said, now that I've given you this son, let me see, do you really love me, Abraham? And will you really obey my commands? And he told Abram to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, some would think that maybe Abraham got confused with the pagan religion because that's what they did. They offered their children up to a pagan god. 
Some may have thought that, but the Bible says that the Lord told Abram to do this, told Abraham to do this. And he was testing him to see just how much he loved him. And when he took his son to that place to be offered up, it's amazing that Abraham had enough faith in God to know that if he were to do this, that God was able to raise him up. I'm going to show you in the New Testament where it tells us this very fact. So in the 22nd chapter, it says that God did tempt Abraham. Now that word tempt means test because the Bible says that God does not tempt any man, but God will allow test during this time in dispensation and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now God did this because God was planning to give his only son. And God wanted to see if this man that he had called out would do what he would do, would love him the way he would love Abraham. And Abraham was showing God, yes, I will. That's why Abraham was so chosen, because Abraham loved God regardless of anything. Abraham was willing to give up his only begotten son for God. And God said, no, Abram, Abraham, I don't want you to give up your only begotten son. I will give up my only begotten son for you. But now I know that you really love me. You will give me your only begotten son. You will give me your all. And now I know that you really love me. And so as he did that, and he took his son, and he took the wood, and he took everything that he needed to take, and he took the young boy. And as they were walking up to the mountain to offer up the sacrifice, Isaac looks at his father and he said, Father, here's the wood, here's everything, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham looked at his son in chapter 22 and verse 8. And Abraham said this, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. You see, God is so strategic, and people of God are so prophetic. Abraham was speaking in pro prophecy that God will supply himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so Abraham had enough faith to know, hey, I'm going to do this, but as I'm doing this, God's going to supply the sacrifice. I know that God is, is going to come through for me. And sure enough, God stopped Abraham, read the chapter, stopped Abraham from offering up that sacrifice of his son and turned around and lo and behold, a ram was in the bushes, stuck because his horns got stuck in the bushes. That was the sacrifice. Abraham uttered it out of his mouth. He uttered those things. And those things came to pass. You and I can have faith in God and utter out of our mouth that that we're believing God for. I'll give you a personal testimony of one day, my son, who was a minister of music from the age of nine, and he would go to church and play the organ. We'd have him in a nice shirt and pants, but he wanted to wear suits like the preachers. And one day he came home and he said, mom, I want suits like, they, like the preachers wear in church. And I remember it so vividly. I was walking in faith and I had my Bible in my hand, going to my bedroom. And I looked at him and I, well, I didn't look at him, but I just held up my head. I said, son, God will provide. No sooner did I say that, I went into my room to, to take off the church clothes and get ready for bed. And we had someone knock at the door or ring the doorbell. I believe we had a doorbell then because I was in a brand new home that the Lord had allowed me to build as a single parent. Never forget that. 
And someone rung the doorbell, but the kids were watching TV and they had the TV up loud. So nobody heard it, but I heard it. And so I came out of the room and I said, did anybody hear somebody was at the door? Did anybody answer the door? And they said, no, we didn't hear it. And so they went to the door and they opened the door. There was no one out there, but there was a box, a big box left at the door. The kids drug the box in the house, pulled it into the living room and opened the box. Guess what was in the box? There were about eight or nine suits in the box of all different colors. And my son tried them on and they fit him perfectly to a T. God provided, just like Abraham confessed out of his mouth, God will provide himself a a sacrifice. And when they turned, there was a ram stuck in the bushes and God did just what Abraham said he would do. Why? Because Abraham trusted in God. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just talk to you face to face. If you put your trust in God today and you declare with your mouth what God will do for you in faith, the Bible says, Jesus says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he saith. This is faith at its highest degree. And when we really believe that God loves us and wants the best for us, and when we know who we are, that we can declare the word of the Lord, God will come through every time. You see that that son that God had, that Abraham gave, gave that God gave Abraham, Isaac. As we go through this Bible study, you're going to see where Isaac, he had two children and they had children and they had 12 children and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And in 1948, Israel became a great nation, just like God promised. Did it take, did it happen overnight? By no means necessary. We know It didn't happen until 1948, but God promised Abram that son. He gave him Isaac. They began to multiply. They kept the traditions of the Israeli uh, faith. And in 1948, Israel became a great nation. And to this day, we know that they that pray for the peace of Jerusalem shall be blessed. And we're going to stop and we're going to pray right now for the peace of Jerusalem. Father God, we thank you for this people that you called out. But not only did you call them out, you've called us out. And we'll go to the New Testament and we'll learn where your word says you came unto your own and your own received you not. But to as many as received you, to them you gave power to become the sons of God. And that's where we are today, grafted into your family, adopted into this royal priesthood. And Father God, we thank you. But we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that their eyes will be open, that they will believe that Jesus is that Messiah that they've been waiting for, who's already come and who's coming back again, that that Jesus is that Messiah that they crucified but he's coming back again. May their eyes be open. May the Jerusalem and the Israelites have peace in Jesus, knowing who you are. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. So um, we're gonna get ready to end this segment. And until next time, I'm going to say Shalom. My name is Pastor Linda Cowles, and I am the president of Anointed Community Services International right here in Groveland, Florida. God bless you. God keep you. God make his face shine upon you. And may God be gracious unto you and give you peace. Join us for our next segment of Exploring God's Word. God bless you. Shalom.